much by the Ogoni people, we have observed that the oil company, Shell, Chevron, MPC, and the Federal Government of Nigeria have conspired to ignore our demands. In fact, very soon after the 4th January 1993 protest march, leaders of Ogoni nationality were invited to Lagos and held discussions with very senior officials of the Federal Government. After the discussions, which were held in the most cordial atmosphere, we were assured that our representations would be sent to the presidency and that we will be contacted within 12 days from then. Rather than keeping to the promise to get back to us, what we now, what we now witness every passing day are threats, crude intimidation and harassment of our leaders and people by the security agents. Two recent incidents clearly bring into focus this ugly trend. A group of army and naval officers, ostensibly on what is now their routine patrol of Ogoni land, late at night woke up the family of the Windags who operate a petrol filling station in Bori. On being informed that the filling station has closed, they got members of the family beaten up and inflicted serious bodily injuries on them. The second incident occurred at Kedere Bomu oil field, where a contingent of police officers accompanied by shell officials harassed and assaulted many villagers, including one Mr. Clement Badam and the pregnant wife who wanted to fetch water at the shell flow station situated in the town. Information available to us further reveal that Shell, since after January 4, 1993, has been pumping oil double the number of barrels it was taken away before now. Evidence also disclosed that the River State Government has also engaged in acts calculated at humiliating the Ogoni people. Some Ogoni people have been invited to clandestine meetings by the State Government and induced to frustrate the legitimate struggles of the Ogoni people. Even some Ogoni youths seeking employment in some river state government parastatals have been turned back and asked to await the time that the Ogoni people will get their country or state. We have viewed the above developments with considerable concern as we do see them as crude attempts at provoking and precipitating violence in Ogoni so as to find a ready excuse to blackmail our struggle and possibly provoke physical war in conjunction with the environmental war that have been waged against Ogoni people for over 30 years. Before we are all killed, we want to reaffirm the resolve of the Ogoni people to resist any attempt at frustrating our struggle for self-determination. No amount of blackmail by force of arms, deceit, girl, primitive harassment by security agents, undue influence and all sorts of crude strategies will diminish our resolve in this regard. In the name of God, and in the interest of peace, we appeal to all well-meaning Nigerians and the international community to put pressure to bear on the federal authorities and the oil companies to desist from these acts of intimidation and provocation. We must restate that the Ogoni people will continue to resist these acts of aggression and exploitation by our self-appointed adversaries until our demands for political economy as containing the Ogoni Bill of Rights are honored. We firmly say no to exploitation and no to subjugation. We are determined to resist these evils with the last drop of our blood. Ogoni must survive. Signed, Dr. G.B. Layton, J.P.O.O.N. Mr. Mite, what is the date on that Exhibit 5? This is 3rd of February, 1993. What was your position in the leadership of Mossop at that material time? My Lord, I was a legal advisor of the organization. What was the position of the late Ken Sarawiwa at that material time? My Lord, let me say that as at that time, we had asked, he was the spokesman of the Ogoni people. We had decided that to place him in a situation that he can, if you like, an ambassador plenipotentiary that can rule all over. We created that position separate from the presidency. But he was not the president at the material No, time. he was not. Dr. Layton was the president. Now, are you aware that the federal government reacted by enacting the treason and other offenses decree number 29 of 1993? Yes. The federal government's reaction before that, sir, I want to say that neither Shell nor the government issued any rebuttal to these allegations that were made, which were widely published. Federal government's reaction then was to issue what we call the Ogoni Decree, which was that any group that carries either a flag 
or even claim that you are a distinct people, anything was guilty of a treason and it was supposed to be sent, I mean, uh, on conviction, it was death. Death penalty. Please. Decree number, right. decree number 29 of 1993. Treason and other offenses, decree number 29 of 1993. Yes. We'll make are a copy available later. Are you tendering it? Well, no, we are going to make it available know. later. You have a, a copy? Yes, sir. We'll tender it. No, not here, sir. We have, right. we'll send for it in the library. We'll make it available before we wind up, sir. Photocopy. Yes, sir. That's all right. Thank you. Go ahead. My lord, the importance of that is that a lot has been said about division in Ogoni, which is always flagged as an excuse for anything. But I want to say that even as early as February 1993, as it is clear from what Dr. Layton said there, there were attempts to induce some people. There were attempts to blackmail us, to introduce violence, so that to use it as an excuse to deal with the Ogoni people and frustrate our demands. My Lord, after that, the leadership of most of them, Ken Sarawiwa of blessed memory, Dr. Layton of blessed memory, uh, Chief Edward Kobani of blessed memory were constantly harassed by security agents, SSS, on several occasions because of that peaceful protest march. My Lord, let me say because a lot has been said about Mossop and violence. My Lord, the decision to confront the slick alliance between Shell and the Nigerian dictatorship. True nonviolent struggle was a well-considered and accepted decision of the organization. In fact, the constitution of tendered is founded on the principle, most of constitution is based on the principles of nonviolence and equality. Mossop was aware that he could have easily targeted the economic installations in Ugoni to the detriment of the Nigerian economy had he wanted to adopt violent means. But we opted for that system, which will show, will draw out the violence of the oppressors and present them to the world for what actually they are. And we have since then maintained that stance. And we are irre irrevocably committed to that approach. Mossop was intent on breaking new ground in the struggle for democracy and political, economic, social, and environmental rights in Africa. We believe that mass-based discipline organizations can successfully revitalize moribund societies and that relying upon their ancient values, morals, and cultures, such societies can successfully reestablish themselves as self-reliant communities and at the same time successfully and peacefully challenge tyrannical governments. Mossab also believes that debt-ridden, morally bankrupt Nigeria must be a federation of equal ethnic groups, irrespective of size, with each group being free to control its resources and environment and exercise its political right to rule itself according to its genius. Mossop therefore had a firm philosophical base and proceeded to translate its vision into reality by the formation of organizations through which it could get to different strata of Ogoni society. My Lord, the movement for the survival of the Ogoni people is not just a membership organization. It is actually an umbrella of several different organizations that exist in each village. You have the National Youth Council of Ogoni People, which is the acronym of NICOP. We have the Federation of Ogoni Women's Associations, the acronym FOWA, the Conference of Ogoni Traditional Rulers, the Council of Ogoni Churches, the Ogoni Teachers Union, the National Union of Ogoni Students, the Ogoni Students Union, Ogoni Central Union, and the Council of Ogoni Professionals, as well as the Council of uh, the Ogoni Leaders of Thought. My Lord, what happens is that you cannot belong to Mossop just like that. You have to belong to one of these organizations. For example, as a lawyer, I belong to what we call the, the Council of Ogoni Professionals in my village. The Mossop in my village will consist of the leaders of all these organizations in my village. An election from that place throws you up 
to the kingdom, because we have six kingdoms. I'm from Gokene. An election, again, throws you up to what you call the national level before you are now elected. So it is something close to what I think maybe was mimicked rude, crudely in the form of the option A4. So every person has a route to your community and up there. That's how MOSOP operates. So it is not something of a group of people who just sit down in one room and form an organization. Malab, MOSOP as an umbrella organization was and is still very democratic outfit. Its decisions are taken after full discussions which emanate from the grassroots. Decisions are also quickly transmitted to the grassroots. This explains the effectiveness of MOSOP. MOSOP empowered the Ogoni people and destroyed the culture of subversions to a few men who derive their power and influence from the Nigerian government, whether military or civilian, and often use that power to denigrate the people. It is thus an innovation in Africa. There is no question of any one individual or a few individuals among being able to impose themselves or their desires on MOSOP. My Lord, the introduction of violence to Ogoni Shell's contractor called Wilbros were laying pipelines through the heart of Ogoni sometime at the time and continue to do so until 30th of April 1993 when farmers in the village of Biara came out to protest the bulldozing of newly planted crops, the non-payment of compensation, and the failure to do an environmental impact assessment study on the project as stipulated by Nigerian law. Shell did not hesitate to ask soldiers of the Nigerian army who had, it had hired to guard Wilbur's workers to shoot at the unarmed protesters who only held palm branches in their hands. One man was killed, 11 others received gunshot wounds, and Madame Karalu Kogbara, who is here, will be a witness in these proceedings, was shot and had her left hand amputated So today. My Lord, the shootings of 30th April 1993 angered the Ogoni masses in the extreme, and there was a spontaneous demonstration against Shell and Wilbros. The Mossop Steering Committee met very quickly and dispatched myself, the late Ken Sarawiwa, and the late Edward Kobani to appease the demonstrators. We first issued a press statement calling on Ogoni people to go back and send it to Radio Rivers. It was blocked. They said they had instructions not to take any statement from, uh, on, from Mossop and from the Ogoni people. So we had to go back that evening. We drove to the villages. We met the demonstrators and spoke with them. Luckily, we spoke to them and calmed their nerves and told them that there will be some justice in that matter. After that, we met with the then governor, um, Ada George, who, to whom a letter that had been written by Shell asking for the usual assistance to enable it to resume construction of the pipeline. My Lord, I think I will seek to tender a copy of that letter by Shell to the governor asking for usual assistance. This is a copy of the letter. Six. My Lord, if I may read As my Lord, please. It's a very short one. It's a very short letter. Letter dated. It's dated 4th May 1993. Yes, read it. The letter is dated 4th May 1993 page stroke three zero point zero one 
His Excellency, the Governor of River State Government House, Port Harcourt. Your Excellency, disruption of work on the 36 inches Rumuekwe Bomu trunk line. With reference to our page stroke 3, 0 0.01 of 19 March 1993, I regret to inform you that work on the Bomu end of the line has been forced to stop because of some community intervention. A copy of the letter from Will Bros, a major contractor currently engaged in the construction of the trunk line, is attached. As at now, work has been suspended in the area of the line, which carries a significant portion of the crude oil production from Shell and Elf operations. We humbly request the usual assess assistance of His Excellency to enable the project to proceed. Yours faithfully, for Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited, J.B. Udofia, General Manager, East. My Lord, it is important to make some explanation here. Before this time, so that people will understand the usual assistance, before this time there has been what has been very much known as the Umuichim problem, where a community had a peaceful protest by a community Shell had called in, had requested the government to send in troops, preferably the mobile police. The subject matter of that case will be a petition to be heard. But what is there is that the village was raised down, many people were killed, and as a result of which the, um, a commission of inquiry was set up. My Lord, I'm happy that the council that uh, representing Shell today, the SAN, was Attorney General as at that time. Uh, where is Umuichim? Umuichim is in a chair in the River State. Go ahead. My Lord, it is also important that I should be able to say that because of what has been said and some misunderstanding, that most of some of the allegations have been that the Ogonis, through Mossop, has been confrontational. Contrary to this, my lord, Mossop has seized every opportunity to dialogue with every government. First, the Babangida dictatorship. They made half-hearted attempt to speak with the Ogoni leadership. The Inspector General of Police invited Ogoni leaders for discussion early in January 1993 after the, after the march but nothing came out of, the, of that discussion. In February, the leaders were guests of the State Security Service headquarters at Abuja, where the riot act was read to them. After the shootings and death of April 30, they were once again invited to Abuja, this time to meet with the highest level of authority short of General Babangida himself. Present at the meeting were Major General Aliu Muhammad, National Security Advisor, Brigadier General Ali Aliu, Director of the National Intelligence Agency, and Alaji Aliu Muhammad, Secretary to the Federal Government, Federal Military Government, I must emphasize military, sir. At the meeting, the Ogoni delegation, which consisted of the late A.T. Bade, late E.N. Kobani, Dr. G.B. Layton, and Ken Sarawewa was instructed to detail the Ogoni demands and produce a list of unemployed Ogoni youths, as well as a summary of the treatment of oil-bearing areas in different parts of the world. Another meeting will be fixed once these details were submitted. In the meantime, it was stressed that to the authorities that there should be no confrontational activity on the part of Mosul and the Ogoni people. A special appeal was made in that meeting by the Director General of SSS for the construction of Shell Pipeline to resume. My Lord, every time we have always had a good relationship with any incoming government, we try to talk, but once the issue of Shell comes in, that's when violence comes in. Every administration from then till today. My Lord, it must be added that every government since the beginning of this struggle starts with the right step of engaging Mossop and the Ugoni people. This, however, changes as soon as the issue of oil and shale comes up. As stated earlier, we engaged the Bangida regime. Ada George was even one of the first to provide support for Mossop in terms of financial support. We also met Shonekon, we met with Ewan, and even we even met with the late Sani Abacha. On the 2nd of September, in fact, on the 1st of September 1993, 
we were summoned. They were told, I got a telephone call from the late Ken Sarawewa that we were going to Abuja the following morning, as early as 7 o'clock. And I said, look, we are not, how, what is going to happen? He told me that he has received the summons, the director of SSS here had come to inform him that we are required to be in Abuja to meet with General Abacha. And I said, are you sure this was not an arrest? So he asked me, instructed me then that we should put a press statement that it is possible arrest. My Lord, a special jet was brought to carry only I and him to Abuja. And we went through, we flew us to Abuja. The next day, that is the second, we met with General Abu Abacha over lunch. My Lord, the discussion, he apologized about the seizure of Ken Sarawiwa's passport, that overzealous security people and spurious, he used the word spurious security reports, were responsible for that situation. He will order the return of his passport. It's also curious, I must say, sir, that one of the things we had in that meeting was suggestions as to whether I will accept to be maybe a member of UMPADEC and whether Ken would accept to be an ambassador. My Lord, we had stated that this was an issue for Ogoni people, not about individuals. And and we had what I now know to have been a very serious step uh, threat because it was like, in this country, it is easy to ask for what I want or what my company wants than what my people want. Uh, we took it just as a statement, but I now know with benefit of hindsight that it was actually a threat. My Lord, I will say that this trend, we, after that meeting, that was before Abacha took over. Apparently, he was preparing for his coup. When Shonekon came, we also met with him, and nothing came out of it. After Abacha had taken over, we met with General Dia. I remember that particular time I and Ken went to meet him at his Ikoi residence in Lagos. When we got there at that time, I think the Oba of um, Ibadan was there. We met him in another room, and one remarkable thing that I saw is that in the course of the discussion, he, Ken was cracking his usual jokes and he was laughing. And Ken laugh, laughs very loudly. And the man, General, was like, so you laugh? I didn't know that you laugh. The information we have about you is that as you come here, you will start fighting. And from that point, Ken said, look, let them you start talking if, so, if they feel that I fight. And we raised the issues. We gave him a copy of the Ogoni Bill of Rights and explained the thing to him. And he read over and said, these things are not difficult. I didn't know that this is what you are asking. What people are saying is that you are, you are a secessionist movement and all that. We should go home and do certain things that they will listen to us. They will call us at a different date. Nothing came out of it. My Lord, after that, we had to meet with the... Um, the then chief of army staff. We met with uh, um, MC Ali, I think a general or something, manager general. I'm not quite sure how these people give themselves ranks. But, but we met with him. In a friendly manner also, they will listen. Nothing came out of it. Since then, every administration, even when um, 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 Colonel Como came, we were one of the first to even meet with him. We had an excellent rapport with him. We were going in to government house to meet him, to brief him. And Ken told him, tell me what you want us to do in Ogoni, and we will try and do it. Tell me what you don't want to be done, and we will find a way not to do it. I remember that was said in my presence when we met with him. My Lord, all this continues, every administration you have that dialogue with them. But once the issue of Shell, including the present, as I was saying, we had everything that we've said. 
And it is only when Shell issue comes up that you find a problem. Last year, I had written a letter to Shell International complaining about the activities of Shell. It was then that the, everything happened. I have had since then two assassination attempts on me. I have had my house burnt since last year. I've been detained without trial because of the protest letter that I wrote to Shell International. And when I had to complain to the Inspector General of Police, we met with the Deputy Inspector General of Police, who incidentally was the Commissioner of Police during the time of the incidents in Ogoni. He is now the Deputy Inspector General of Police. And we have not said anything when he told me, look, we have intelligence report that you burnt your house and took the pictures abroad so that they will give you money. And that was how he dismissed the facts of arson and threat to my life. My Lord, this has become a very situation. The essence of talking here is that some of us are like endangered species. And I do not think that perhaps we might have another opportunity to have this there. So let the world hear. When was your house burnt? Last year, sir. That was um, on the 12th, I think 11th or 12th of April last year. Sir. Now, what is the name of the Deputy Inspector General of Police you are talking about? Bukali. That's us. My Lord, the present Commissioner of Police in River State was the deputy to Bukali when he was Commissioner here. So there is a tendency to always protect or defend the past. So I'm only explaining what I mean by the continuum because you are hit against... My Lord, while I was detained, because I was in the, before the Supreme Court when there was some incident, I was there with Femi Falana. The same day? The same day. But in spite of that, with the record of the Supreme Court, they held me and even charged me for burning a house that is still there. That house that I'm ch being charged for, is that house still stands still today. But my own house that was born, no person has been charged. That continues till today because the, I wrote The charge is still pending? It's still pending. Before the magistrate court? Yes. Since when? Well, since, um, yeah. that was since April last year. They have not gotten an address, I mean, any advice from the DPP. They are still waiting for legal advice. For legal advice. Over one year. For over one year. From where? From Bayasa State? No, River State. <laughs> River State. River State. <laughs> now. Uh, Ladun. As the burning of your house been investigated at all? No. I mean... They are not, I say, even the assassination attempt where some people were even caught with arms and they made confessional statements, nothing was done. They even changed, after hell, the man changed the statement. And when we published the fact of what happened, even the DPO was thrown away and uh, punished because they said he was, he was uh, siding muscle. For how long were you detained recently? My Lord, I was detained for five days. And one remarkable thing is that in detained. the course of my interrogation, I also saw one or two police officers who asked me, do you remember me? We were the guys who were also involved in that interrogation in 1990, um, 1994. So you find a situation as if you are, you, you cannot live out of a particular trauma. The same people are there. As I speak to you now, the SSS person that was always chasing me, they call him Tunde, um, he was a man in uh, my local government area. He is now back in that same position. So you get the same people, the same security reports about you, and that is what happens. So you are being trailed every day by this same thing. So that is the point I was making about a continuation of the same protest. And it starts with everything will be okay until you protest against Shell. My Lord, my deputy, the deputy president of Mossop, Dr. Kamalu, also around this same time was to travel to Canada. His passport has been seized since last year till now. They say he has not got clearance in the democratic, a supposedly democratic uh, outfit. Till today, his passport is still with them. My Lord, it has dawned on me how unprotected we are in the Nigerian state. And that is why I thought it is important to say it for the world to hear before we are also passing through the same thing again. Because the plot, I've been so much involved in this matter that I can see the plot and smell it when it is coming, and that's why we are here.
that's the most important reason why I'm testifying. My Lord, just a minute. Are you humbly requesting this Commission of Inquiry to order the immediate release of the passport of Dr. Olua Kamalu, Vice President of Mosul? Yes, my Lord. That's a humble application, sir. Go on. Now, are you aware that there is a list of wanted Nigerians at the airport? My Lord, anytime you go in and out of this country, even now, up till now, the first person you hand your passport to, either you are coming in or out, is an SS operative. They check in the computer whether your name is about one of those they consider security risk. And Every time I travel, we go through the routine of clearance in, I mean, out or there because they say we are on category A. We are not supposed to. My, my love, my own name is number nine on that list. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what? Uh, what, what, uh, what, 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 what do we, uh, what, we want to understand what you mean by category A. What, what does that mean? My love, there are certain people who are considered as that is the first class security risk to which I think to the to the government. I mean, let me say that when I come to my recommendation, sir, there is what has become the personification of the state. So if you say something about whoever is in power or you criticize, then you are supposed to have criticized the state. You are now an enemy of the state because they, they think of themselves as the state. So these people who they feel these are the front line op op opponents of any regime come under category A. And that's where they say I and my learned friend uh, Femi come on that list, sir. I think I should also help him. General Basanjo is number one on that list. <laughs> and the yeah, name has, the list has not been removed. You are in good company. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, you in the in Lagos. You had a villa there. Yes, sir. And the state house. Yes, sir. Where he occupied. Yes, sir. And you occupied a small room. A small one, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, go on. My Lord, let me, for the purposes of the records, say something about the boycott of elections by the people in 1993. My Lord, a crucial meeting of the steering committee of Mossop was held on the 2nd of June, 1993. At the usual venue, the residence of the then president of Mossop, Garrick Layton, of blessed memory. My Lord, at that meeting, two issues were tabled. First week, the committee received a delegation of the people of Gokena, which came to formally inform the committee that the resumption of construction works on the Shell oil pipeline was not acceptable to the people. The message was noted by the committee. Next was the issue of the presidential elections due to be held on the 12th of June, 1993. My Lord, a motion to boycott the elections was tabled and was exhaustively debated by the committee. The reasoning was that a boycott will make the point that the Ogoni were disenchanted with the provisions of the constitution under which the elections were being held. Since that provision deprived them of their oil resources, and this was regarded as discriminatory. My Lord, that's the provision of an exception to the fundamental rights that says that any property in uh, uh, any land where there's oil or gas belongs to the federal government. So even though some of the presidential candidates were saying, we will deal with the, your issue, we knew that with the constitutional provision that there was nothing they could do because there was already a constitution that was in place. We decided that we needed, we have participated in all the elections, 
But for the presidential elections, we wanted to make this point. My Lord, we took a vote, and 11 people voted for the boycott, and six voted against. My Lord, the proposal to boycott the elections, like any important most of decisions, is not just left for the steering committee of Mossop. It is then placed before the Ogoni at the Congress. Malawi, what we call a Congress in Mossop, is the executive of Mossop in every village now convene in all the 223 villages of Ogoni will now meet and then you now present an important issue like that and it was so done and it was endorsed. Instruction was very clear. Any person who wanted to vote, allow them to vote. And these were some of the things that happened. There was, in fact, the problems that happened that led to some of the, the, the disturbances, which is now put as if it was part of this issue, was that there was, when Ken was arrested, I've forgotten the precise date, but he was supposed to have traveled with me to the World Congress World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna in June 1993. Around that time, we, his, he was stopped at the airport. I managed to go. Later, he was seized at just somewhere where they call UTC bus stop, just next there, by the SSS, in a manner that people feared he was going to be killed. I think there was a spontaneous protest all over the Oguni land over that, even in Port Harcourt here. My Lord, in the course of that protest in Bori, police shot and killed some people. That was what led to a protest that they went to the police station. What I understand, I was in Vienna then, but the reports we received was that people went to that to the police station and broke the place and removed all the prisoners who were in the cell. That was the sort of protest I had. The report we also got was that at that time, Noble Obani, went by vice president of most of them, was the person and some other people who were now sent, the steering committee met again, they went home and tried to quell the disturbances at that time. This was the circumstances in which, which has been placed uh, and sometimes misread. These are the things that I thought we need to say. My Lord, yesterday a lot has been said and dates confused in the minds of the commission about what has been called the Ogoni Andoni problem. I want to say that the what has been called the Ogoni Andoni dispute started quite earlier than what you were being told yesterday. Indeed, the first signs of problem were that on the 9th of July, 1993, about 60 Ogoni people, about 60 people, mainly from the Bodo community, returning from the Cameroons. There are a large Ogoni population, my lord, in the Cameroons, because when the oil has made it impossible for them to fish in their rivers, all our fishermen go to Cameroon and return at the end of the year. We have a population, 1999, I had to visit them in Cameroon, and we have uh, over 20,000 Ogoni people in fishing ports in that place. And they are going through a whole lot of harassment by the Chendems in that country because their rivers cannot produce any fishes. About 60 of these people returning from the Cameroons, at this time, I must say, there were military patrols all over Ogoni and naval patrol in the seas, all these people from Bodo were attacked and killed. The Bodo community had to write a protest letter as at that time. And I have a copy of that letter, which I seek to tender. Ledu, is Bodo in Cameroon? Where is Bodo? Malab Bodo is in Gokana, Ogoni, one of Thank the you. kingdoms of Ogoni. Thank you. Malab, I'm sorry because the documents are so plenty. Just I'll look for.
I want to tender this after now, but let me. It's there. Where the paper was written? Check there. My Lord, sir, may I suggest that we go on while we sort out the documents, sir? Ledu, Mr. Mitty, yeah. please, can you go on while we try to look for the documents to save time? Okay. My Lord, as I said, the issue of yeah. what... Oh, let, oh, let you have it, sir. Motion, please. Can you go ahead? My Lord, as I said, the issue of the Ogoni and Doni disturbances, which has been said, after the incident which I said, there were raids, military raids, on Ogoni villages from the Andoni axis. My Lord, there has never been a dispute between the Ogoni people and the Andoni people. At this time, there's, we are, because a Komunwa clash is either over fishing rights or land or anything. Nothing. We were just living peacefully. And then the next day, you see, you now see armed people attacking those communities. It has been stated that this thing was, it was yesterday, as if it was around... 1994, 95, and all this sort of thing. This thing, as I will say, my lord, was quite early. And then the governor, the judge, was still there at the situation. The then, the late Professor Claude Ake was even going to go into the issue of a peace meeting. We met several times with him. My lord, I have here a photocopy of a press statement by the late Claude Ake over this incident. And it is from the Guardian newspaper of Friday, 5-11-93. Just to give you an example of, I mean, a proof of what it is that this is an incident that happened quite earlier than what has been stated. We seek to tender the documents. 
What date is that? Let do. Friday, 5th November 93. It was page 5. Yes, sir. Guardian. Of Friday. What day? Friday. Date. Date. Five. Five. Eleven. Ninety-three. Page five. The late Professor Claude Ake headed a peace committee. Is that correct? Yes, my lord. Exhibit eight. As my lord, please. Guardian newspaper of Friday, fifth. November 1993, page 5. As a copy. Exhibit 8. Yes. My lord, the, it is supposed to be a letter which he wrote to Chief Rufus Ada George, Executive Governor of River State Government House, Port Harcourt. I don't know whether my lord wants me to read, read it. it. Read it. Your Excellency, Anthony Ogoni Peace Agreement. I am writing to express my misgivings about the peace agreement on the above conflict which was signed on October 6, 1993. I would have preferred to ignore it except that it raises important issues and also because having been publicly identified as the chairman of the Peace Conference, it is popularly assumed that I had something to do with it. My concerns are as follows. One. The resolution was made with unseemly haste, ad hoc, over a day and a half. And as far as I can determine, the claim that it was made after many days of truthful deliberations between all the parties is misleading. A matter like the conflict in question, involving so many damage to property, enormous loss of life, a huge tide of refugees, and so much suffering, deserving more serious attention. This unseemly haste does not, to my mind, show respect for those who have died and those who still suffer. Nor does it serve the cause of peace. To be sure, it serves our standing as peacemakers. Sorry. Yeah? It serves our standing as peacemakers who may now be credited with another mission accomplished. Our standing as peacemakers, who may not be, but have we really achieved a peace that can last beyond the removal of the troops currently stationed in the two communities? I hope so, but I doubt it. It is ironic that we proceed with such haste now, when we took so long to disengage the combatants, even after they had unanimously called for force deployment. It may well be that the long delay was due to circumstances beyond anyone's control. But the fact is that most of the dying and the destruction occurred during this long interval. We should at least have offered an explanation and expressed regrets. You will recall that I have insisted all along that the process of peacekeeping should be linked to compassion for the loss and suffering of our compatriots in the two communities and accordingly advocated a massive relief package. All that is on offer now is, and uh, all that is on offer now is a resolution affirming the need for the relief and inviting it. It is embarrassing that neither the Peace Committee nor the state government has gone beyond this, and it is grossly unfair to the people of Andoni and Ogoni. Some other communal conflicts that were far less destructive of property and lives have had the benefit of substantial relief and rehabilitation resources from state and federal government. Paragraph 3 of the peace agreement proclaims fairly that there are no outstanding issues as a basis for conflict between the Ogoni and Andoni communities. This is hasty and a dangerous judgment. Even if there was none, and that is doubtful, the history of the conflict and the grief it has left are basis of conflict. The need to be addressed, and it is well to do so. Reports on the conflict have noted the scale of systemic nature of the destruction, as well as the sophistication of the operations. These features raise questions about whether 
the conflict is merely communal, and also the possibility that the communities might have been victims of some other forces exploiting a local situation. It was surely in the interest of the communities as well as the national security to have looked more carefully at these issues. I worry that this peace agreement so hastily made and proclaimed may prove more normalcy than what actually exists, especially considering its brave commitments to ensuing safe passage. I hope that the two communities will take such assurances with caution and that, safe, and that companies who have unresolved problems with the communities will not make easy assumption about the new status of these problems. Its misleading signals, its misleading signals are given and conflicts develop. It will be unfortunate and we, the peacemakers, cannot entirely escape blame. I am amazed that the peace agreement was signed without prior consultation with the communities and ratification by them. How can we bind people to such undertaking if we do not consult them, especially when they are the very people who bore the brunt of the catastrophe? I find it difficult to escape the conclusion that this manner of proceeding does not accord respect to the communities or show enough sensitivity to their suffering or serve the cause of peace. We might be confusing a ceasefire with peace. I hope that we may avoid the perils of this confusion. Professor Claude Ake signed. My Lord, as I said, this was the time of that issue. As at then, it has been painted as communal clashes. My Lord, several times, I remember on one occasion after that time, there was a visit to that place by some military people and some Ogoni people. All the people who went there came with the conclusion that the sophistication of destruction that they saw was military style. I accompanied an American diplomat. Bring those documents. I want to see them. I know the things I want to tender. This is the exhibit. But I accompanied an American diplomat sometime after that to visit the town of Ka. I remember that diplomat picking some of the shells of the bullets. And I think it was a military attaché to the embassy then. And he said this was of NATO specifications. And the military style of the attacks, in fact, on that day, as the military attaché was going back, right in his presence, three or four Goni people, four of them were shot, and he met them in their pool of blood. And for even asking a question, even that diploma was arrested and taken to, to Port Harcourt because there were roadblocks then on the road. My Lord, even after this, uh, that was on the 5th and 6th of August that the Ogodi market village of Ka on the Andoni border was attacked with grenade, mortar shells, and automatic weapons. 247 people were killed, and all the villagers forced to flee. The primary and secondary schools in the village were laid waste. Foreign journalists who visited the scene the next day confirmed the carnage. On both days, the villagers of Temnama and Terawe on the Andoni border with Togoni were also attacked and properly, and properly destroyed. Several lives were, were lost. On September 1, we also have already told that about our visit to Abuja. Further attacks against Ogoni villages on the Andoni border were staged by armed troops. The troops used boats belonging to Shell, and on the days of the attacks, a Shell helicopter was always seen flying all over the place. The villages of Eke, Guara, and Kewingbara were devastated in these attacks, which took place between the 1st and 5th of September 1993. Over 1,000 Ogoni men, women, and children were massacred, and about 20,000 rendered homeless. We then received rumors that attacks were also being planned on other Ogoni villages from other areas. 
Even before the rumors could be checked out, the attacks took place. The most dastardly of them happened on the village of Kmea, in which every single concrete building, including the secondary school, was destroyed. My Lord, even as Kmea lay in ruins, we were now summoned to meet Shoneko, the then head of the internal, of the interim government, national government contraption. The meeting took place on the 21st of September. It was upon our return that we knew the precise reason for the summons to Abuja. My Lord, a fictitious security report, which I have cited. Get me all the details. Bring it. Okay. Okay. My Lord, a fictitious security report had stated, which I cited, in fact, we used to have a copy, but all the raids from most of offices had removed that particular one. I've been looking for it, and, and because we were almost underground, it had been difficult because we kept a good arsenal of documents in this matter through our own sources. Sir. My Lord, we saw inserted a security report which had intimated Abuja that about 10,000 Ogoni youths had dug trenches all over the way from Bori to Ne Junction a few miles to Port Harcourt, and that they were attacking, they were, that the petrochemical and the refineries were about to be attacked by these people. My Lord, yesterday, <coughs> excuse me. Yesterday, Colonel Okuntimo had requested the declassification of certain documents. My Lord, I believe for the truth of these matters, it is important that the whole file, whether it's SSS, whether it's police, whether it's the army on these issues, should be declassified. So that you see the origin of these spurious security reports, which led to this thing. Who were the people who were initiating these reports that led to these things? Because that might help the process. Well, that security report was the basis for which the government was now using as a clamp down on these things. That was what happened. We then, that was the very first day. That same day was the day that Kmea, the village of Kmea, was flattened to the ground. My Lord, a lot has been said about what we we'll call vigilantes. People have even used the word NICOP vigilantes. And I think it is important that I make some comments about it in the spirit of saying exactly the truth and nothing but the truth that I swore to. My Lord, at the time of these attacks on various Ogoni villages, the Ogoni people were nervous, and there were considerable fear. It is true that we, Mosop, had gone to the point we had a situation that our unarmed people were being attacked in this military style. We had gone to the army, to the governor, and we have even gone, as far as even Ken had to meet with the chief of army staff, General Abacha then, to seek that they should get some military people to be stationed in that area. Because at a stage, as he has said, there were troops in those areas. The police were asked to withdraw. Any day of the attack, you will hear that police had withdrawn. The troops will have withdrawn. Then the attacks will come. And the attackers will come. And in those sort of circumstances, we found that there had been we suspected that it had been these things were planned. We thought we needed to go a little bit out of this state to seek for some protection between these people. My Lord, I tell a story because it is difficult now to say certain things. But in the interest of truth, I want to say this. And I'm not going to reveal my source because it might be a problem for him. My Lord, I met with somebody who works with Shell, who was now is a do medical doctor, who had also was opening a, a, a clinic. And I said, why do you open a clinic when you are well paid? And he told me that he didn't want to go through his experience, that he went, that he was flown from his station 
to go and treat people, that there were clashes between two soldiers. And he was flown to Andoni to treat some soldiers who apparently were wounded. And so he felt he will not, his conscience will not allow him. I'm only saying that even in these incidents, we have reasons to suspect the fingers of Shell in those attacks. My Lord, it is important that there was also reports, Amnesty, which had also interviewed soldiers and published the report of soldiers who claimed that they were brought from Ekomo to say that some people, they were going to Cameroon where people were attacking um, um, Nigerians. And they eventually found themselves in a place where they were attacking Ogoni villages. So these communal clash that had no basis in, that had no basis whatsoever about whether there was a dispute over fishing rights and all that must be seen in that light. And this is what happens in most of these things. Because common work clashes that either you are disputing one thing or the other. My Lord, I come back to the issue of the vigilantes. At the time of these attacks, as I said, the Ogoni villages were nervous and there were considerable fear. Each village called out its youth and ordered them to organize the defense of the villages. The youths called themselves vigilantes. It had nothing to do with muscle. It was a desperate measure since the youths were not armed. But it is also, but it was an important uh, psychological tool, if I will use it. However, when these armed attacks on the villages stopped, the vigilantes became a social problem because they were also doing all sorts of things around. When all I concede that that was a social problem. But then, the then president of Mossop, um, Ken Sarawewa, issued a statement, because then we don't get to this thing. We circulated over 10,000 circulars written under his hand, and later I wrote another one. My Lord, most of our documents, I have copies of them. Do you have it? My Lord, it's not here right away, but tomorrow I can tender those those letters. Someone is faxing it from London for me because most of our stuff have been kept away, sir. My Lord, we wrote to all the villages about these things and we personally even reported some of the, the people we felt were, were involved in this, even arrested them. Colonel Kuntemu himself will also know that there are occasions where we reported some of these people to him and even arrested them, some of the people we felt were constituting this social problem. So rather than taking the fact that Mossop was encouraging, once we saw that this issue was also in the society, we took steps to stop that thing. But I'm not denying the fact that there was some social problem created by the fact that after this situation, there was some problem in the area. That is the issue, that's the truth of the issue of the vigilantes. There's nothing in the Mossop thing or NICOP that says that you, I mean, that talks about vigilantes. Indeed, by our constitution, any person that goes, uh, that is violent, is expelled, and we've expelled several people by that process. Because we cannot, how can you pitch half a million Ogoni people against the largest army in Africa? And against one of the biggest, and you think that you can use force. We do not even live in a place. Ours is a flat land. So one day, they will overtake you and kill every person. So it's never an option for, an Ogoni, for Ogoni people to think of maybe a violent confrontation with the state. It has never been an option. It will be a suicide. Hello, Mr. Ledumite. The letters, the notice, public notice issued by your president that you are talking about has been reproduced in a book titled Ken Sarowa and the Crisis of the Nigerian State. Are you aware of that? Yes, I'm aware. Please, have a look at it. Yes, my Lord. Is that yeah. a letter? Produced um, as Appendix 4 on pages 389 to 391 of the, of the book entitled Ken Sarawiwa Crisis of the Nigerian State. Which we is a the book, sir.
an appendix, appendix four of the book, from pages 389 to 391. That page, your appendix, which? Sorry? Appendix four, page. Appendix. Page 389. 389 to 391. 391. Turn that as exhibit 9. As my love, please. Uh, can you read that? Yeah. Notice. My love, please. 24 Agri Road, PO Box 293, Port Harcourt, Nigeria, 10th November 1993. To all traditional rulers, village heads, CDC chairman, all Ogoni people, public notice. The attention of Mossop has been drawn to reports of activities of certain persons who are said to be engaged in several acts of lawlessness and wanton destruction of lives and property in Ogoni villages. Available reports indicate that these people claiming to be acting on behalf of and support or with the support of Mossop or NICOM have been arrogating to themselves powers of intervention in disputes of all kinds. Mossop condemns in unmistakable terms the activities of such persons who are believed to be sponsored by enemies of Ogun people for the sole purpose of discrediting Mossop. For the avoidance of doubt, Mossop dissociates itself and all its component organs from, the, from these activities. Ogun people are hereby warned against bringing any dispute before this group, but to always report cases requiring Mossop attention to the Council of Ogun uh, traditional rulers and all to Mossop offices which have now been opened in all kingdoms. Traditional rulers and all of these are hereby advised that on no account should any person be harmed, molested, or his property destroyed on any witchcraft allegation or for other purposes. See Mossop President's letter of October 5th, 1993, which was also on this issue. Mossop stands for truth and justice and does not support any acts of lawlessness in any shape or form. NB, all village heads, CDC, members of Kotra should engage, ensure that their town criers Announce this in all villages and towns in Ogoni without delay. Signed, L.A. Meter Esquire, Deputy President of Mossop, for Mossop President and Spokesman of the Ogoni people. What I date? What date? That was signed, that was 10th November 1993. I, I, I signed that. And following that, every Ogoni village announced this through the use of town criers in all the villages. Malawi, the second letter. It's 20th January 1994. This is a letter written to um, the commander, Peacekeeping Force Bori. Peace and Security Ogoni. We have reports that the following are at the head of a group of hoodlums threatening security of life and property in Ogoni. One, Winka Asiga, alias Kuti of Mogo. Two, Ike Ekpere of Lubara. Three, Nathan Nebari of Beri. We will be grateful if you will have them arrested and put away for a time to give us opportunity to see if the rest of the groups they had behaved properly. We shall, however, we shall have us study this. After studying the situation, identify other hoodlums when necessary and pass their names to you for appropriate action. We will cooperate with you fully henceforth to ensure security in Ogoni. Thanks. Yours faithfully, Ken Sarawiwa. Copy to the camp commandant, Bori Camp. The same book, or this is another letter. The, the same same, book. It's the same book. It's on that same page, sir. All right. The point of talking is a concrete. Part of exit name. Yeah. Malad, contrary to the allegations that were being made, Mossop, when we saw a social problem, took steps to distance itself and tried what a responsible citizen could have been able to do in order to help restore normalcy in the area.
happening time for it. Yes, go on. My lord, when there was a change of guards, when General Abacha seized power in November 1993, Lieutenant Colonel Dauda Musa Komo was then appointed the military administrator of River State. My lord, he arrived Port Harcourt to assume duty I think on the 14th of December 1993. My lord, the security mafia in Port Harcourt had a message waiting for him. On the 12th and 13th of December, right under the nose of the police, Navy and Army, the residences of Ogoni people at several waterfronts in Port Harcourt were targeted. 53 Ogoni men, women, and children were massacred, and all buildings belonging to Ogoni people dynamited out of existence. My Lord, before this incident, we had received reports, complaints that there was going, that this report, that this was imminent. We then went and met, I can't remember the person, I and somebody went and met with the chief of the Ogrika community in the waterfront, that we hear that this was an attack, that they want to use them to attack us. And he claimed that he didn't know anything. We even went and said there was nothing. He issued even a, 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 a paper to circulate to his people. We had copies, one of the files that were seized by the security officers. My Lord, one of the things I'll also ask you to order, there were a host of most of files and documents which were seized from the Mossop offices and from our houses and all that. If they bring some of these documents, all those documents, they should produce them. Because some of these things were quite recorded. We kept very meticulous record of everything that was happening. So even before the Okrika thing, we got wind of it. And the Okrika people said, look, we have no problem with you. How could it happen? But in spite of that, as I said, this attack did, to, did, did take place. Well, Lord, Confronted with this rubble upon his arrival, I and Ken met with him. And I think, to his credit, he did exactly what was expected of any responsible person in the circumstances. He set up a commission of inquiry headed by the, the serving military officer, I don't know whether he's still serving now, Major Paul Taiwo, to investigate these dis dis disturbances and make recommendations. My Lord, that report is still in the bosom of the government, but we have leaked copies of that report, which we reproduced and published in the Ogoni Star newspaper, which I have here, and I seek to turn. We seek to turn the Ogoni Star, my lord. What date is that? there are two, because it continues, November, the edition of November 1 to 14, we publish weekly, 1999, and the one of December 17 to 26, 1999. Oh, one by one. Okay. November, November 1 to 14, 1999. I'm sorry, my, my lord, before it is marked admitted, may we just have a look at it? It is the period that concerns... This is uh, a commission of inquiry, not a court of law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Have a look. You want to have, have a look.
Yes. Oh, we have no objection, my lord. No objection. Otherwise, even if you have, if this is incorrect, you tell the correct one. You have the correct one. <laughs> The one of November is exhibit 10. The issue of uh, December, exhibit 11. December star. Yes. yes. Do you want to refer to any specific? My Lord, I want to refer specifically some portion to make it fast. Exhibit 10 or 11, which one? Um, first exhibit 10. 10. All right. It says that ch chapter 1, disturbances. Media reports and the evidence of a few witnesses suggest that the disturbances were a clash between two communities, the Ogonis and the Okrikas, who live at the waterfronts. However, the overwhelming evidence before the commission suggests that the phrase communal clash described the events inadequately. Indeed, this rather tame and benign phrase may be downright misleading. This rather str strong statement is made because a common work clash in the eyes of this commission is a flare-up that results from a series of incidents between two parties of a progressively serious nature. Each party suspecting and perhaps preparing for a possible confrontation of a physical nature, possibly with dangerous weapons. The commission discovered that it was not so in this case. Rather, the evidence before the commission suggests a situation in which one well-prepared party caught the other unsuspecting party sleeping in the series of attacks coordinated with military expertise and precision. The following poems inform uh, the, the commission. And then it went on. The conclusion is not far-reached as the commission, in the course of these proceedings, received evidence, a circular in which, in the hands of the security forces, purported to have been written uh, by a group called the Okrika Aborigines calling for uh, a total celebration of, uh, uh, sorry, total celebration by the Okrikans. My Lord, the point I'm making is that the commission found that it was not a communal clash. My Lord, on Exhibit 11, the issue was raised about Mossop and his role in the crisis. The commission filed themselves able to say, the commission wishes to point out that it has been, that the commission is not conversant with the history of, it, that is on the, on the heading E, Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People. The commission is not conversant with the history of this organization, except to say that it came into limelight about two years ago. Many witnesses, especially representatives of Abuloma community and the Okorika Council of Chiefs have made before this commission strong allegations against Mossop to the effect that Mossop not only planned the disturbances, but also directed Ogoni military operations during the disturbances. The commission wishes to point out that it has painstakingly investigated these allegations to try to establish a link between the disturbances and Mossop, but was unable to establish Mossop's involvement in the disturbances in the remotest possible way. The commission therefore concludes that the allegations made against Mossop are completely without foundation and are a clumsy attempt at shielding the real culprits by pointing fingers at innocent parties. From the evidence you listened to yesterday, from Colonel Okuntimo and Colonel Daudakomo, you will agree with me that government did not believe in that report, the River State Government? My Lord, they did not, that's what they said, and they did not publish anything on this report. And in fact, he did from the public, and we were only managed through some sources to even see it. 
Wait. Just finish with your written memorandum. Let's go. My lord. My lord, although must have made every effort to always interact with the government on this issue, certain things happened. My lord, on November 28, 93, just about a month after I got married, I was in my village house after Christmas in um, my village, Kedere. My Lord, then, okay, because yes. we I were always... November. Sorry, I said December. December. 28. 28, I see. Yes, sir. I was surprised. <laughs> when you said you were in the house after Christmas in November. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My Lord, at that time, we, the head of the task force, the International Security Task Force, in Ozoni was one. In Ozoni was. At that time, the head of the International Security Task Force in Ogoni was one Tunde Odina. My Lord, we have been friendly with these security forces because, as we said, we were trying to use, if there are cases of hoodlums at that stage, because they have, the, the, they have usurped, I mean, the police was no longer there where the people you have to meet. And um, he came early that night to see me at home and said, oh, what of Christmas, I should bring a bottle of gold, which I gave. I didn't know it was like a surveillance. But by midnight, we had just barely gone to bed, around 12. The f I was woken up by banks on my door. About three military trucks had driven into the community to my house. They jumped out they, as if they were going to war. They have encircled the whole of my compound. And then they banged my door, forced me, forced the place open. In fact, I and my wife were still naked. They put me... They took me away. I only barely dressed up. I, it was in the vehicle I met Dr. Owens Wiwa. They drove us that hour of the night and dropped first at the Air Force Base in Port Harcourt. We stayed at that Air Force Base until early hours of the morning. They were always radioing whoever their commander was. Eventually, we were taken to the house of one, I don't know, that time there had just been change of guards. And the, I think it's where some of the civilian government, I mean, government officials were being kept at um, Rumo Lumeni Street on that road there, on the old GRA. They dumped us there. For two days, we were not given food. And we stayed there, no person to talk with. We were just sitting there until, and we were detained there until I think after the second, third day. That was the first time I met uh, uh, Okuntimo when he came in there. And I spoke to him and said, look, this is what has happened. You people have kept us here. We don't know anything that has happened. Why are we here? Nothing. And told him we've not eaten. And it was then that he now sent people who went and brought us food. That was after the second day. My Lord, we were kept there until after, I think, the 4th of January 1994, when we were now released. Apparently, the, we now think, considering the time they detained us, it was maybe to forestall our participation in the Ogoni Day celebrations of 4th of January 1994. At that same time, the late Ken Sarawiwa was being placed under house arrest. And that was the first encounter I had over this incident.
personally. My Lord, following the representations which we regularly made to the new administration, the, a ministerial committee was sent by, I think it comprised then Chief Okilo, um, see Alexi Bro, who was internal, security, uh, internal affairs minister, and uh, one other person, to tour the oil bearing areas of the country. They started their tour of Ogoni on the 19th of January, 1994. My Lord, the, after that tour, we engaged them, we talked with them, and they promised they were going to make reports about the Ogoni case, but I still say that nothing happened till then, I mean till date, about that situation. My Lord, in April, it came to our attention that there has been what they call a police order. April 19, 1994. There is a police order detailing their op operational order, detailing their operations that they were being planned in Ogoni. No, this one, there's a police order. This one is referred here. There's a police uh, operational order. That's why I know the document. Bring it here, you can say no. My Lord, we came by this document this document is dated 21st April 1994, Operational Order Number 4 of 94, Restoration of Law and Order in Ogoni Land. My Lord, I seek to tender the document. Exit 12. 12. As the court pleases. Can you read exit 12? Just the relevant portion. It's a bulky document. My Lord, the, before I read exhibit 12, I wanted to tender one other document that will help to explain. My Lord, yesterday, because it's a different proceedings, the exhibit 5 yesterday, which is reversed the memo which Colonel Kuntimo denied his signature. We call it the forgery of the year. I want to tender that document in these proceedings. Okay. All right. So you have two numbers. Uh, why not refer to it? Okay. If, because since it's a different proceedings, I thought maybe I needed to do that. So but it's a separate um, document, not the one we tendered already. It's already in another petition, it's tendered. It's not the same exhibit. It's the, the same, same document. document. Yes, but not that one tendered. I know the contents are the same. The contents are the same. But the papers are different. We can tell that this in this case. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Ah, that's all right. Okay. Then the... come, come, come. What is that one called? My Lord, it's called uh, River State Internal Security Task Force. Uh, sorry, they call it fa Government House Fax Sheet. Fax. That. Fax Sheet. That sort of. Government sort of House. Yes, let me see the other exit five. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's the the forgery of the century. Uh, five. Which exhibit is this? Could you more Yes. My Lord. The point I'm trying to make in reading in order because yesterday it was claimed that this document is not correct. Mm. I want to say that that document, this document which I'm now tendering, is it referred, 
that document which is uh, supposed to be a forum, refers specifically in the second page to this document exhibit 12 because it says oh, let's turn that first so that we don't lose sight exhibit 13 that is well, exhibit is. 5 in the other case exhibit 13 here okay my lord in exhibit exhibit 13 says on page one, one, under recommendations, new checkpoint, slightly different from operational order number four stroke 94, dated 21.995 by Commissioner of Police, Rivers Police Commin Command. That is one of the recommendations here. Yes. My Lord, that document which they say they wanted to set new checkpoints different from is Exhibit 12, Exhibit 12. that operational order. Order number four. Yes, sir. So I'm only trying to show that to prove the points, in each, I'm going to now show in each case how some of these things can be proved independent of that document. Right. In exhibit, exhibit 12 is operational order number 4 of 94, restoration of law and order in Oguni land. My Lord, it's a bulky document. I don't know whether my Lord will, but it shows you the deployment of troops which they intend to do in the whole of Ogoni. In fact, they said they wanted to come to show that we remain part of Nigeria, which we have never denied. My Lord, if you see here, there is, they said, forces available. Manpower for this operation, for this onerous assignment, shall be drawn from the following forces. The Nigerian Army, the Nigerian Air Force, the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian Police, PMF, that PMF, that Police Mobile Force, and conventional units. The sister forces mentioned above shall prepare their respective operational order, which will determine the number of personnel to be involved. The Nigerian Police Force will source manpower from the following divisional formations, and it names them, all the people that they are going to use in those areas. My Lord, it's also instructive that at this time, in the same exhibit, exhibit 11, it is mentioned that there have to be restriction of foreign visitors into Ogoni. My Lord, I have a document by Chioda, a company. That's it, bring the documents. I know. Yeah. My Lord, one of the companies operating around Ogoni is called Chioda Nigeria Limited. And I have the letter, a memo dated 10-394, which I seek to tender. Exhibit 14. M394. March 94, I hope. Memo, March 94. My Lord, in Exhibit 13, which I have earlier tendered, on page two, it says, restriction of unauthorized visitors, especially those from Europe to the Ogoni. My Lord, this document, Children Nigeria Limited, Exhibit 14, to the admin, administration manager through Mr. Noto from Santiago, subject, Eleme Petrochemical Complex, security report. According to the federal government's security report, they claim that Ken Sarawua the leader of Mossop has invited four white men to come and survey the oil fields in Oguni land. As a result, security agents have been out on full alert to check the identity of all foreigners entering into Oguni and around Port Harcourt, particularly those coming in and going out of Port Harcourt. As a result, it has become imperative that every expatriate should carry at all times 
at least photocopy of their relevant documents. My Lord, at this same time, um, <coughs> there were also Dr. Owens Wewa and, Owe, and um, Noble Obani Wimbare were arrested and detained at Bori Camp. And a foreign journalist who also was visiting Oguni that time was detained and, in fact, deported. I'm only trying to show that this was a trend. Independent of this, all the things that are here were happening. So that even if he says, that you can see that almost all the things that are in that document were happening around the same time. My Lord, on, East, in, on Easter Day in April 1994, troops also struck Ogoni, this time on the northern borders. Information we gathered from even some of the soldiers said security report was sent to Abuja to the effect that 10,000 armed Ogoni youths, always the magical number 10,000, were on their way to attack Afan power station. Abuja had no difficulty, apparently, to order the, the operations that took the whole villages of the Bangui area, 13 villages on the northern borders of Uguni were flattened and destroyed. And up till today, all the schools, all the churches in that place, up till today, despite all the things we've said, none of the governments had even allowed the people even to go back to that area to rebuild their settlements. All those people who live there remain internal refugees till today. My Lord, it is also yes. My Lord, it was in these circumstances, as I said, if you see the document My Lord, as I said, the exhibit The operational order was in April. No security, no constables here to keep order. I don't see any. Are there? What are they? Control. It's all right there. No, the people there. All right, now. Nobody is touched. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, after a look at Exhibit 13, again, Exhibit 13. Yes. That is the document that has been described as a forgery of the century. Yes, sir. If you look at page 2, If you look at the remarks, yes. surveillance in Ogoni leaders considered as security risk muscle propellers. Yes. Did that take place? My Lord, my Lord, at this time, this was some of the things that happened later were explained by this memo. We didn't know exactly. I have to be honest, this was even leaked to us after some of the incidents had taken place. My Lord, the, on the 21st of May, I do not want to, to go through the whole problems, I mean the whole story. It's an area that is quite difficult for me to recount. But I'm talking about the, the Gyoko incident, the, the murder of the, of the four prominent Ogoni chiefs. 
My Lord, it's one of the most painful things to me because one of those people, Chief Edward Kobani, is my maternal uncle. And you can imagine how painful it is to not only to, uh, to lose such a person, but to be accused of the murder of such a person. My Lord, before you go further, Ken Sarua also had a relationship with them. Yes, um, the, the late um, Chief Orage, Samuel Orage, and Ken, I think they, their wives are sisters. So they are from the same home? Yeah, the, their wives are sisters. The children are first cousins, both of them. My Lord, it is true that it is quite true that there have been disagreements following the decision to boycott those elections, which led to the resignation of the president then and uh, Dr. Leto and, um, and uh, Chief Kobani. I do not intend to go into all these issues, particularly in the spirit of reconciliation that we are. But the murder of these people happened in circumstances that I believe is consistent I, with the, what is contained in Exhibit 13, which is like some of the things that we have read already. Because there was evidence before that tribunal from a PW8, Stephen Hassel, a police officer. Which tribunal? Before the tribunal. Which one? The, the outer, the outer tribunal. tribunal. Don't know what. My Lord, Stephen Hassel, the police officer, and his proof of evidence can be available gave evidence to the effect that, and it was very clear that there were security presence in Ogoni on that day. Before you drive just a few kilometers, you will see them. This is a time also that this operational order we've tendered is there, which there is supposed to be surveillance. He gave evidence that they received report from one of those who is executed, Dr. Kyobe, who came, he was a commissioner then, who came to report to him, and his, he was in charge of the security forces, there, about five kilometers away, he was in Bori, not up to five, maybe four kilometers from the scene, that there was a riot which was just happened around that area, and that they should come, and that he had told them that they were under instructions not to go there unless others came from above. They always talk of above. That was his evidence before that tribunal. And they did not intervene until six hours later. My Lord, if, I don't know, but with the benefit of what we've gone through, perhaps if they had intervened earlier, who knows whether they would have been able to save some of these great lives. And why was it that they would not intervene until six hours later, even when the report, was, the report came to them early? My Lord, I believe, and I agree with the, that portion of the petition of the family of the four, that the government failed, or the, by acts of commission and omission, <coughs> were responsible, and are responsible, for the death of these great sons of Ogoni. You are blaming the government for the killing of the Ogoni four. Yes, I think the evidence makes me come to that conclusion. I'm now, afraid. do you recall that Dr. Kubel? who was later found guilty and executed, was the one uh, PWH was referring to. Has Avu come to the police station? Yes, yes. To alert them that there was crisis? Yes. Now, Dr. did, uh, to your knowledge, Dr. You, Dr. Who? Dr. Kilben was a commissioner under the Como regime in River State here. He got the permission of Konekomo to attend the program. 
No, that's the top And when he saw a tumultuous crowd, he ran to the police station. Come and help. He said, no, we are not going there. Now, are you aware that are you aware that the following morning after the unfortunate incident at Gyoku leading to the murder of the Ogoni Four, that the River State Military Administrator, Konekomo, then addressed the whole world in a press conference. Are you aware of that? Yes. In fact, the, the, I had the interview. It's about 10 in the morning. Because yeah. what happened on that day was that we had, we had gone to even try to see him. We tried to see the Commission of Police, ICANN, and uh, good luck, Barikumbe. When we had that, the first report we had was that there was a riot. And we went to see the commissioner of police. Is there anything we could do or something? And we tried to see Como. They said they were attend attending a, a banquet or something. As the commissioner? No. W when we met the commissioner, he yes. said the place is a military area that we, we can't go. Then we tried to see the governor, the people. When you say the, we, who are we? I can, um, I think, good luck to you, um, Barry Kumbe, yeah. uh, some, uh, uh, I've, I can't a delegation of Mosul. Yes, and uh, we couldn't see him. They said they were going somewhere that we should return in the morning. But by that night, late that night, I received a telephone call from the House of Ken that he has been arrested by soldiers and troops. I had thought, and in fact. The person who called said, look, we need to, to run. And I said, why do we run? If you run, they will think that we're doing this thing. All I will do is that I don't, I'm not comfortable. I'm not a soldier. I don't feel comfortable that soldiers should arrest me, particularly late at night. So I did what I thought was reasonable in the circumstances. I left. I didn't sleep at home. But the following morning, as early as 7, I went and reported myself to the police. I said, people came to my house. And by that time, they are broken everywhere into the place and held the occupants, some of my cousins who were at home, hostage until I came. But I did, I'm not comfortable with going to, to the army because I've not been in the army before. I went to the police and reported myself. And I told the police what had happened. They said they were not looking for me. And so I was there when the radio was broadcasting the the press interview by the governor. I was, at that time, not in any cell. I was just staying in the office of one of the officers where I had, it was then, because the police didn't know what to do with me at that time. <laughs> they were not looking for me, and they didn't know how to ask me to go, so we were just staying there. It was during that interview that I had that him say that the murders had taken place and that Mossop was responsible and that he has already ordered that all the Mossop leadership be arrested. It was at that time that the police even thought that maybe my movement needed to be restricted. Even because before then I was, they were allowing me to go out to even eat and, uh, and uh, even buy newspapers to read. Are you aware that this press conference by Konekumo uh, was recorded, video recorded? Yes. If you see the press conference in the film, will you be able to identify it? Yes, sir, definitely. Please, can we? We have the film, sir. Press conference is exit 14. Ask my left, please. No, 15, rather. Exit 15. Thank you, sir. 
Fourteen is a memo, M394. On the following morning, Lieutenant Colonel Como held a press conference. Despite there having been no judicial investigation into the murders, which Mossop had immediately asked for, he is convinced of who is responsible, and their forensic work was displayed for the cameras. And in the bag there, for you to insert later, are remnant and pieces of bones from various parts of body that they have been able to recover from the scene where the burning took place. Look at it. Yeah. I see. Yeah. This is one, two, three. So a portion of the mouth here has been torn off and then bumped, just as you can see. But then this particular appearance of teeth will actually convince you that this is part of human. Yes. Yeah. And so many other things. A gun is uh, bleeding, and not by federal troops, genocidal federal troops, as some of the papers carried from days past, but by irresponsible and reckless stubbornness of the Mossad elements, which, as I said, must stop immediately. And I therefore call on you to report accurately this event and to stop is being used as propaganda tools conveniently for some dictator like a um, Sarah Weaver. Sarah Weaver and other Agoni leaders were taken into detention but not charged with any crime. That's okay for now. 